All right, welcome to the A Game Podcast. I miss you guys on Thursday, but we are back strong on Monday with a great episode with the amazing and outstanding Chris Root. So I appreciate everybody being patient. Had a uh, some crazy stuff that'll make some great podcasting and some good uh, some good radio and some good lessons going on with some of these properties that took me off a little bit on Thursday, so I wasn't able to get one in, unfortunately. But back in business. So uh, once again, I hope everybody had a great weekend. And uh, starting strong Monday, we have Chris Root on today. He has worked with Grant Cardone on wholesaling. He's fix and flip properties all over the country. He's known as one of the top wholesaling real estate coaches in the country, and he is specializing in mobile home parks. Now, we have Frank Rolf on. Chris is a little bit of a different approach. Right? I like to have different people on so you can get different angles because there's definitely more than one way to skin a cat. And what works for some people doesn't work for others. So it's always interesting to dig in and hear the various ways that people make money. And it might seem overwhelming to some people when you hear so many different strategies, but you know, to me, it can also be really exciting to know that there's so many different ways to make money in real estate, even in the same asset class with the same people in the same areas gives you a lot of opportunity. And I think that that's uh, something to be optimistic and exciting about. So I appreciate Chris Rude coming on. He's got a uh, mastermind coming up soon that you guys can check out. If you go to the show notes, I believe it's in Louisiana in, uh, in a week or so. Um, the, towards the end of September. So definitely check that out if you guys are interested. And of course, as always, this episode is brought to you in part by Nationwide Business Capital Group. If you go to nicknicknick.com slash links, not only will you see all the ways to connect with us on social media, you will also see a link under affiliates to click on a way to email Marianne and tell her the A-game podcast sent you over and get you some money to do your real estate deals. So whether you're beginner, advanced, intermediate, you have money, you don't have money, you have credit, you don't have credit, you need for fix and flips, you need for bridge loans, you need for rentals, you need for whatever it is, Marianne is your first stop to help you out. Tell the A-game podcast sent you over, she will take good care of you and get as creative as need be to get you funded for whatever your real estate deals are, especially if you have experience, you'll see that she's very creative and she can get you very competitive rates in terms to beat whatever other options you might have. Also, if you are looking to get into real estate, let's do some deals. I am getting better and better at reaching out to people. Shout out to Barry. We talked a little bit as well, uh, but I've been reaching out to more and more people and getting better and better at knocking them off my list to get some of those conversations going. Whether you want to buy properties from me, sell properties to me, or partner with me on some deals, let's get that going. Uh, looking to step it up a notch, especially if you're looking to get into some small multifamily or mobile home park deals, we can definitely make that happen. So very excited. If you want a free checklist on how to bring more value to your buyers, whether you're a real estate wholesaler, agent, or broker, go to nicknicknick.com slash bigger pockets for your free checklist on how to bring more value to your buyers. I appreciate the listeners. I appreciate the sponsors. If you would like to have a conversation, please reach out to me through nicknicknick.com slash links on any of my social media platforms. I am probably most responsive on Instagram and Facebook. I'm working on LinkedIn, getting better there. Shout out to Yona Weiss for doing an incredible job with this LinkedIn challenge. Definitely something to look up and I'm going to hopefully get him on there. But that's been awesome for all the people I've connected with through there. Hope everybody has a great day. Looking forward to this week, this month, and the next few months of some great uh, experiences, some great guests, and some great content for you guys. Please email me podcast at nicknicknick.com or join our Facebook group and put some ideas. There are things you are looking for us to cover. So I can either get some professional guests on there to cover the topics that you want help on, or I can make sure I do some solo episodes and get you the information that you need. Have a great day. Thank you so much. Welcome to the A-Game Podcast with Nick LaMagna, digging into the minds and experiences of some of today's brightest entrepreneurs in real estate and business, along with Hollywood stars, UFC fighters, and your favorite rock bands. People that have figured out how to overcome obstacles, take chances, live boldly, and no matter what they do, they always bring their A-Game.
All right. My guest today on the A-Game podcast is a full-time real estate investor, coach, and entrepreneur. He is the author of the Amazon bestseller, The Source of the Deal, How to Dominate the Wholesale Real Estate Market and Generate Massive Cash Flow. He is a specialist in creative real estate investing and one of the most well-known wholesale coaches and educators in the entire country who has worked alongside some of the most amazing names, including Greg Cardone. He is a uh, successful track record of fix and flips, wholesaling, and land development, and is now a mobile home park specialist. He has 350 units over eight parks, boasting a $22.5 million portfolio. Father of five, Model American, welcome to the A-Game Podcast, Mr. Chris Rood. Thank you, man. Glad to be here. I'm excited to have you on, man. I, I've, I've, uh, I've done a lot of research on you. I've been listening to the stuff you're putting out on YouTube. I've listened to you on a bunch of other podcasts. And you have an incredible backstory. And I think you're the perfect type of guest for this show for a lot of the pivots you made and the things you've done up and down. And like we were just talking about, just the mindset of an entrepreneur, how you get where you are, uh, is really the most important thing. So for people who are not 100% familiar with your story yet, can you give a, like a quick 30,000 foot view of who you are and where you came from? Well, I'm... Uh... I'm 40 years old. Got five kids. Um, I was kind of always a um, kind of always very, very on kind of weirdo, kind of a, a hard headed type of kid growing up. Very, very high energy. Very, very strong willed, and um, didn't do well in school. Got labeled ADD, ADHD, all that stupid horse shit. They label kids. They got a lot of energy, and they put me on all kind of psych drugs, which kind of whacked me out for a little while. Kind of whacked me out from like eight or nine to like I was shit 21 years old um but anyway you know was already kind of entrepreneurial even at a young age I was I was selling basketball and baseball cards out of the back of my my book sack when I was in fourth and fifth grade um just innately you know you know I had a, I was I remember selling some Shaquille O'Neal rookie cards for uh you know spot price out of the uh, was it the Beckett bucket the Beckett yeah, yeah. Uh, Listen, I'm not how old you are if you remember that, but uh, um, so I always entrepreneurial kind of um, skill set where I wanted to, you know, make money and, and do things of that nature. Struggled through high school, uh, you know, kind of troubled because I got into drugs, which kind of attributed that to, you know, being pumped for the Adderall and Ritalin when I was a young kid and kind of made me just off, right? Just if you're watching this and you got any of your kids on that garbage, take them off ASAP. That's just terrible for them. Um, they're probably just a, a you know, a, a maniac and got some, got, got a lot of energy and they don't belong in a, in an environment like that, where they got to sit behind a desk for eight, nine hours and <laughs> obey like a lo loyal sheep that they want to uh, train you into being right. I just wasn't meant for that. And I'm, I never was, I was never meant to be a cage animal. So from there, you know, got into, you know, college clean my act up around 22, I actually had to myself into a rehab because I was addicted to prescription to Adderall I was addicted to prescription drugs from them, them putting it on putting me on drugs when I was eight years old went through a rehab program got off of all kind of got off all the psych drugs and um and I felt like I got my life back right and I, I renewed sense of energy renewed sense of uh self-respect in life and I wanted to take all that focused anxious energy that I always had as a younger kid. And I wanted to focus it on something that was actually beneficial for me and my family that I could use to the benefit of me and making money. So I decided I want to be an entrepreneur. So I went, I went around thinking about how, what can I do? Right. And I had no idea. I had no skill sets. I knew I knew how to sell and I could talk to people, but I had no skill sets. So I was like desperate to start a business. So I came up with the idea of on-site oil change, going to people's houses and changing their oil and washing their car. And I got the idea because my dad sent me to get one of the oil change uh, in, the, in his vehicle while I was working for him in South Louisiana in the oil field. And um, while we were waiting there, there a bunch of people complaining about how long it was taking. They gave me the idea of, hey, I, I could probably go and meet them at their office or house and make a, a quick hustle because I'm bringing the service to them versus them having to stop on their lunch break and go bring to get their oil change. So borrowed $100 from my dad, bought a set of wrenches, oil drum, and some oil and an oil filter wrench and some tools and um, got a hundred cards made. And I started handing out cards everywhere I went. And it like blew up really quick. I mean, before I knew it out every day, and this is while I was in college, I was probably a sophomore in college when this was going on. By the time a, a six months, eight months had passed, I was changing, you know, four or five people's oil almost every day. And I, and I ended up going and handing out cards to all the oil field accounts in this area where I'm from in South Louisiana. It's very all, you know, all and gas dependent. So there's a lot of fleet accounts with these big oil companies. I got hooked up with some of these bigger oil field companies and I was 
you know, I was rolling in between class. I would go and change, you know, 10, 10 oil changes, you know, for 500 bucks and I get all full of oil. Then I'd go back to, to school and take my last hours for that afternoon, all full of oil. Did that till I was a, about a junior in college, about a year and a half later. And I, and I kind of branched off in, into doing auto glass repair and replacement. And I kind of, bit, kind of meshed all that together, doing on-site oil change, car wash, windshield repair, replacement. By the time I was a senior, I was making like a hundred grand a year. And this is like an 04, 05. So that's a lot of money for a 22 year old, 23 year old back then. And um, shit, I graduated college and I was like, I'm not going to get a job. I mean, my buddies were going to get jobs making 30, 40 grand a year out of college. I'm like, why would I get a job? I'm making a hundred grand a year. I'm just going to scale what I'm doing. So got out of college, did that full time. Then I started making real good money. I was probably making hundred grand a year just doing it out of the back of my truck but i wanted to take it to the next level and i realized i couldn't scale that business model i had bought two trailers had a couple employees but it's like i'm chasing all these people i need to get a shop i need to get a physical location have them come to me so i started thinking how i can do that caught one of a shop that was distressed owner wasn't paying rent went to the landlord told him hey if you kick this person out i'll pay you rent and pay back there you know so where you can get paid so she ended up signing a lease with me kicking him out so i got my first physical location and I started, I, I doubled my income right away just by getting a physical location because not all, I kept my on-site stuff, but also got the, the incoming traffic business from that quick lube mechanic shop. Doubled my income and I was like, okay, this is where it's at. Well, right around that time, this is probably about 06-ish, we had a Hurricane Katrina came and um, um, let me back up. The 06, what happened was, this is right before the, the crash of the big real estate crash. I had just built a spec house and this is when real estate prices were going crazy. And I already had one shop by then. And I noticed that people's houses were like increasing in value every six months by like 10, 15, 20%. It was ridiculous, right? Especially in our area, because the year before that in 05, Hurricane Katrina came and displaced everybody from New Orleans. They moved to Baton Rouge, Lafayette, Louisiana, where I'm from, Houston and Atlanta, where we already had a shortage of houses and the market was crazy. It made the market even more crazy where I was from because of displacement. So it, prices like almost went double again in values. So I told my wife, I said, listen, baby, we got to sell this house. We can flip it. This is like right around all those HGTV shows that were getting real popular, flip my house. So I said, let's flip it. She agreed with me. We, we landscaped the front, painted some window, uh, painted some, some, uh, some rooms. And sure enough, we put our house in the market. We sold it for $125,000 profit. I was 25 years old, made $125,000 on my first flip just by chance, right? It wasn't even just by pure luck. Timing, I would call it just timing. Took that 125000 and I bought another shop that I had caught wind of of another distressed, motivated seller of another quick loop who was on drugs who and had a phenomenal location. It was on the busiest freaking, and he wasn't paying his property taxes or his state taxes or, or sales tax. Called wind of that, made him an offer, got him out of that deal. I took the 125000 I made it, and I put it down as my down payment. I got an SBA loan for, uh, I think I bought that shop for 860000 I put down my 125,000 as my down payment. So I, I took, you know, ownership of another shop, doubled my income again. Then I was like, man, there's something to this real estate game. Cause I just made 125,000. You know how many oil changes, brake jobs and tune-ups and windshield repairs I do to make 125,000. So like, <laughs> we need to keep doing the real estate deal too. Uh, I told my wife that. So we ended up buying a, a piece of property on a land. We thought we were going to build a house on, but we ended up just uh, keeping it for like three months flipped it made like 40 grand on that took that 40 grand bought another shop i just I actually just leased that shop because it was just it didn't it wasn't for sale it was just for lease got a third shop then i bought another house a foreclosure rehab that lived in that for 18 months flipped that made another i think we made 65,000 on that so i was taking the real estate business which i really didn't have a whole lot of experience i really wasn't that good at real estate as i am now that was pure luck and speculation i just timed it right it's kind of hard to lose when every every other month the market goes up 10 15 percent value <laughs> you know I, I look like a genius but it really wasn't that. it was just the market i just got lucky it was all timing but i was using the real estate business to mesh with my mechanic quick lube and auto glass business and i was scaling that business by flipping properties to roll into buying more new physical locations did that for a while, got up to four locations, 33 employees. You know, we were doing, I was, I was 26, you know, 20, 20, yeah, 26, 27 years old, making really good money. It's probably making four or $500,000 a year between all those shops, between my benefits and what I was paying myself and all my, you know, expenses I can run through the company. I did that for a while, got, you know, 
kind of got burned out on and realized like, this is not something that I want to do. I was barely home. I was, you know, my, we were having a bunch of babies. We had, you know, I think three or four kids by that time. And my wife was getting really stressed out because she stayed home with all the babies and I was never home. I was working six days a week. I was only home on Sundays. So I was like, I need to, I need to diversify back into real estate. Cause I got so busy with the lube. I never really got back into real estate. So made a bunch of money. Decide I need to diversify back into real estate, bought a bunch of single. I was like, you know what? I'm going to buy a bunch of single family homes. I bought like 30 single family homes, like three million, three million bucks, putting down 20% and leveraging my credit. Rented all those out. I didn't know how to go direct to seller back then. I didn't know about the wholesale method where you can go direct to seller and capture equity and buy from a motivated seller. I was just making a bunch of offers on MLS and buying at 80, 85 cents on the dollar, but the market was hot, right? It wasn't, it wasn't, um, it, it, it was easy to look good because the market was still going up. Well, 2014 came. I started investing in those, those single family homes in 2012. In two years, I bought 30 houses. 2014 hit here in the South. That was kind of our 2008 because in 2008, we didn't have much of a crash because we were heavily dependent on oil and gas. And oil and gas did really well during the 08 crash. Well, 2014, oil went from $128 a barrel to $28 a barrel. We took a freaking beating. We lost thousands upon thousands of jobs between Texas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Alabama. All the Oklahoma, all those states lost thousands of jobs. Well, those houses I bought for 80, 85 cents in a dollar lost a lot of value because most of my renters, I was, I was buying nicer houses and renting them to all field workers that were working offshore, making 180, you know, 150, hundred thousand dollars a year and were, i was getting fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars a month well half those rentals went empty they couldn't afford them anymore because they lost their jobs at the same time my shop started losing a bunch of revenue because my shop was guess what heavily dependent on the oil field accounts too that were all going bankrupt well that uh was a scary moment for me we i think we had just had our third child and um i was worried we were going to probably go bankrupt because I was losing about twenty, thirty thousand dollars a month, and I was like putting it on my line of credit just to pay the bills. And I started slowly selling off my single-family homes because like this is stupid. I don't know what I'm doing. I wouldn't. I didn't. I didn't look like a genius no more, right? So right around that same time, though, by the grace of God, I actually started looking into other revenue sources of real estate, and I came across wholesaling real estate. And I watched it on um, YouTube. My friend is. He would say, I'm not a guru, I'm a guru. I forgot what his name was. But anyway, he had some really cool videos and he was making a bunch of money, posting checks out. He's making twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 by wholesaling real estate. I'm like, wholesaling real estate? How the hell you wholesale real estate? Watched his videos for a little while, watched some other videos. I actually ended up learning how to wholesale a deal on my own and made like some chump change. Made 2500 bucks. I was like, okay, there's money in this. I hired three mentors back to back to back. After my second mentor, 30 days after my second mentor, I made $47,000 on the side while still running my shops, wholesaling real estate. I was like $47,000 profit by myself, just doing the side. I'm like, I'm in the wrong business. So I, uh, I told my manager, hey, listen, here's the keys to the shops. I'm doing real estate wholesaling full time. I need to focus on this. And the only reason I didn't go bankrupt in 2014 and 15 is because I learned how to wholesale and I started making so much money because wholesaling is inducive to an economy that's not doing well because it creates a lot of motivated sellers who need to sell their property. And it was a perfect storm where I could go in and buy properties for cheap and resell them to investors for a spread of five, 10, $20,000. And I started making, you know, 40, 50, 60, 80, $100,000 a month doing this full time. And I was able to cover all my losses between all the single family homes I bought that were empty and all the shops I had that were losing revenue every quarter and real estate wholesaling saved me from, you know, going. And from there, I never looked back, um, did so well with those coaching programs that the coaches asked me to go work in the sales department. I started selling for them, their programs. And I would come to find out and realize I was a better coach than they were because I would, <laughs> I was posting checks in the, in the Facebook group for 40, 50, hundred grand. And like all the students were inbox saying, man, how are you doing? And I'm struggling. And I was, I would show them what they're doing wrong. And I was already a successful guy before then. I had ran successful shops. I knew how to talk to people. I was an entrepreneur. So the way inbox, I mean, I was, I felt like I was helping them uh, coach. And you know, I was like, why am I doing this? I could just do this on my own. I was like, I might as well just coach people on my own. So I, I started a coaching business on the side also. Then went to a mastermind called the 10X Growth Con, the very first one Grant Cardone put on in Miami and uh, sat in the front row seat with uh, Michael Jordan's mentor. Um, what's his name? Um, Tim Grover? Tim Grover. Yeah, sick. We're sat next to him, the whole 10X growth con. We got to hang out with him. And um, 
after the conference, uh, got hooked up with Grant, had a meeting with him. And so I tell him what I was doing with wholesaling. He was really interested. Like, man, this is cool. I never heard. I didn't, I didn't even know what wholesaling real estate is. He goes, you need to come do something with me at the office and we can teach people about your wholesaling. So got hooked up with Grant Cardone. And, um, after that, my, you know, my coaching kind of blew up because not, a, not a, a lot of people knew about wholesaling and Grant was, you know, telling people, Hey, look, there's a way you can make real, you can make money in real estate instead of having to buy millions of dollars worth of apartment complexes. You can learn how to wholesale real estate with Chris Rude. So did that and um, been doing that for a long time, coaching and then wholesaling and flipping. I've scaled my wholesaling and business to, you know, multiple six figures a month. We do two, $300,000 a month now in wholesaling and flipping. Uh, past four and a half years, I've been buying mobile home parks and short-term vacation rentals on the beach. Um, and that's I kind of, that's kind of where I sit now and we're just scaling that model. I do, I do land development now and, and, um, yeah, I'm just trying to help show people how to do it also and partner with them, you know? I think that that's an amazing story, man. Congrats on all your success. And again, it doesn't doesn't sound like it was an accident at all, man. Hard work and, and learning from where to pivot and how to adjust the business, I think, is is a huge thing like we were talking about, just the mindset of, of learning how to identify what's working, what's not, where the best places to put your time and effort are, and having the courage to walk away from stuff like that. I think a Absolutely. lot of people do. You know, that, that's, a, that's a big change there. And you, you said a lot of things that I, I definitely want to touch on, one of them being you talked about your 2014 and how that was basically the recession for where you were. What lessons did you learn from going through that? Because I know a lot of people that are investing right now and a lot of people that are teaching right now that haven't been through a down cycle. And I think it's super important to really, if you're going to learn from somebody, learn from somebody who's gone in an up market and a down market. And specifically with that, you talked about how you were able to make a bunch of money wholesaling. You know, and some people I think, they look at it as a double-edged sword of when the market goes down and we're, we're on that other slide. Yes, you can get motivated sellers, but oh, well, now there's nobody to buy your deals, but that's absolutely not the case. So I'd love to hear yeah. a little bit about your experience and things you took away from that. Yeah, look, I mean, there's businesses that do really well in a bad economy, just, as, just like there's businesses that do really well in a good economy. And there's actually businesses that don't do that well in really good economies, right? And there's, And, and I think for me, Looking back, I'm 40 years old. I've been through three crashes now, the 2008, the 2014, and then the 2020 with Corona. I think the only thing that got me through all three of those is a, it's not one or two or three things, a combination of things. And for I'd say the most pertinent one out of all those is diversification of skill sets, right? Not being good at just one thing. And um, for me, learning to pivot and like you just said, walk away from something that's not working and have the courage to start a new venture and learn a new skill set that is pertinent to what's needed and wanted in a down economy. And I think a lot of listeners can learn from this. If you're young, you're 20 something years old, it's not always going to be happy times. I don't care how much money you're making right now. You have to understand that you might be making a boatload of money. I think for me, like the first crash we had, I was like, I was like, what is this? What is happening? It's like the whole world was coming down. Like, I didn't understand what was happening. And it was scary as all hell because I had a family and I was in my 20s. And it's just like, whoa, what do I do? And um, what you do is you move, right? People get petrified in fear and they get stuck and they just seize up. And for me, I think anxiety can't catch action, right? You just got to move. And if you move, I think things will work its way out. It's when you stop moving and you start looking at your problems, your problems will engulf you into making you seize up. And then that's when you could possibly go BK or, you know, get so stranglehold by your problems that you, uh, you, you can't move. And I, and I think the combination of diversifying, the combination of getting into new skill sets and always, always, trying to learn even when things are good and always moving the needle and always diversifying, even when the times are good and, and learning new skill sets, even when, when things are good, you have a much likelier chance of not crashing when the crash comes because you're already diversified into skill sets. People get, people, people um, like to rest on their laurels, right? A lot of people like to rest on their laurels because they're doing really well and they think it's always gonna be happy times. And for me, I think what I've done well is me and my wife have always pushed the needle even when we're doing good, we're always trying to do better. And so that way, when we have a pullback, if I'm doing really, really good, it doesn't crash me completely. Because if you're barely doing good in a, in a, in a, in a great market, you're going to get devastated when it crashes. 
you got to be crushing it when the market's crushing. So that when it does pull back, okay, now you're just not doing that well, but at least you're paying your bills. But if you barely make, dude, if you can't make money in the U.S. economy when things are booming like they were in 2019, you just need to sit this one out and go get a job because it's just, this ain't for you, right? Because there was so much opportunity. Consumer confidence is so high. People are spending money left and right. So you have to understand that concept of always, always diversifying, always creating new revenue streams. Just like, you know, the past four and a half years before the coronavirus, what was I doing with all my wholesale and flip money? I was invested in mobile home parks for cash flow, right? And that kind of carried me when we when the crash came because the wholesaling and flipping business slowed down a little bit because during the corona, like, I mean, nobody could prepare for that. I mean, they, they were you couldn't even go in people's houses to look at their houses, right? Yeah. And I mean, so that, so that kind of hurt me even in my wholesaling business because I just finished telling you that when the economy slows down, wholesaling is good. But yeah, people might've wanted to sell their house, but they didn't want you in their house. And the government said they didn't have to pay their mortgage. And the mortgage company didn't have to foreclose on them. So they had no reason and incentive to sell their house. So what does that tell you? That tells you that you never know what's going to happen. You got to prepare like crazy. And for us, you know, we're, you know, we made a lot of adjustments in our business for the next go rounds of Corona. If it keep on having new variants where, you know, people keep having more and more lockdowns, we've learned to do virtual and buy people's houses sight unseen. And we've mastered that model. I buy houses all over the country right now. I've never even seen them. I got a house in Maine that I'm flipping right now. We closed in a couple of weeks. I've never seen it, never touched it. We're going to make 45 grand. And we, we did it totally virtually. So it's the, the learning and of new skill sets over time, even when things are good and keep them pushing that needle, that's going to save you. Don't ever rest on your laurels. Keep improving the conditions in your business. Keep on paying down debt. Keep on saving money. Keep on diversifying. There is no simple answer. There is no, like you probably thought I was going to say something like so smart and so intellectually sophisticated, like, oh my God, no, it's, it's basically just that diversify, always keep learning learn 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 that's one thing I, i'm not that bright i'm from south louisiana i got a funny accent we crawfish and alligators and all that crazy stuff but what i am good at is i know that i don't know and i'm a ferocious learner like i read every day like it's sacred that's sacred to me i wake up every morning i drink my coffee at five six in the morning i read for two hours if i don't do that i feel like i feel mentally unfulfilled right you, you, you eat food for the body but books are food for the mind and if you're not constantly feeding that mind and, and leveling up and learning new skill sets through the application of acquiring new knowledge from other people that have been there, I think you'll get hurt on this planet because this planet is so volatile with crashes, booms, busts, crazy shit that happens that only the people that are hyper-focused on building wealth are going to make it. Because if you're just a dilettante, meaning you barely, like you just play around in it and you're like, oh, I'm just going to try to be an entrepreneur. I'm just going to and I do this thing on the side, you ain't going to make it. I agree with that, man. And I think one of the common traits I see for everybody who's successful is the ability to make a decision. And I know I've heard you say, which I definitely want to ask about, is that entrepreneurship is really not for everybody. And I always say the, the road of life is full of flattened squirrels who cannot make a decision. That that indecision is worse than a bad decision. Do you have a process that helps you make decisions? Because you know, I see everybody from, you know, my friends trying to make big decisions like, Hey, should I check myself into rehab to like minor decisions of what should I eat for dinner? Somebody who's just not good at making decisions is going to get stuck in that middle ground and you're never going to get anything done yep. big or small. So how do you, do you have a certain process that you use for decision-making? Yeah. yeah. I focus on anything that doesn't have a high value for its outcome. Meaning I don't think about what I wear. In the mornings, like the, the I, I wear literally the same thing. I, uh, these Under Armour shirts, I have about thirty of them, and I just rotate through colors every day. And I wear the same thing. That's not a decision I want to even put my attention on. <laughs> I don't think about what I'm going to eat. I eat the same thing almost every single day. I don't think about if I'm going to do this or that. Everything that I decide on is high value, activity driven, income driven decisions that move the needle in my life you know, on a financial basis, on a spiritual basis, on a body based on a mental basis, it's 50,000 foot view decisions. Like, I don't give a shit. Um, I'm not worried about what, you know, when I'm going to cut my grass, like I don't do all that shit's automated. I don't, I don't cut my grass. I don't wash my own car. 
all I do is focus on revenue driven decisions that move the needle. And that's the, and, and you have to, you have to develop yourself into that because some people, and some people waste a lot of time too. Like I, I, it's, it amazes me how some people get together with their buddies and they watch TV on the weekends and watch sports and actually fight and argue over who's the best quarterback <laughs> or who's the best rookie of the year. And they can hardly pay the rent and they, and they bitch and complain about their bosses, how they're not paying them enough money. And they don't, and they couldn't even, they weren't worried about the NFL statistics of players and they don't even know the statistics of their own life, you know? So I think people's priorities are so out of whack. And I think we, I think you, you have to develop yourself into getting out of this entertainment mentality and get into an education mentality because I'm not very smart. I just, I, I feel like that, you know, I'm a freak about learning new skills and I read and I, and I, and my whole brain is skill up, right? You know, skills get the deals. You just got to skill up and the way you skill up is practice. It takes thousands of hours, right? I, that's, that's the, the secret is I just, I work everybody and I don't focus on anything that's not important to me. I don't, I don't fucking hang out. I don't smoke weed and drink beer with buddies and reminisce about the old days of shit that's not important because I played t-ball with them when I was in eighth grade or football in high school you see these people live in the glory days and they just they get mired down and 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 living their their purpose through other people's greatness they sit there and watch other people play football and baseball and live vicariously through them because those people are living their purpose and I think once you can find your purpose and live in your own purpose your life will open up and you can um, you can expand your life right because you most people get caught up in other people's intentions instead of having their own intentions about what they think they should have for their life. Thousand percent agree, man. I think that's very well said. And, you know, on the, on pivoting to the real estate side on the tactical side of it, on your wholesaling business, I know with those types of numbers and all those different markets, what does your team or your operation look like? How big is that? How do you communicate with them? Obviously you said a lot of things are virtual now. Yeah. So we got three girls in the office. We're actually about to hire one more girl right now to keep up with the books and writing checks to all the private money lenders because we've got so many flips going that it's, it's tying down the team from doing higher revenue generating activities that, that move the needle. So we have, we'll have four girls in the office starting next week. Um, they, they handle collecting rent. Um, one girl handles all of my marketing, like, you know, the letters, direct, uh, direct mail, PPC, SEO, Facebook ads. Those are the girls in the office that handle that, uh, evictions, um, maintenance calls for, you know, if a trailer is messed up or, you know, something's wrong with the, with one of our units. Then on the acquisition side, we have four partners that are in different markets that we feed leads to the leads come into the office and, the leads, if, once they're qualified for motivation, equity, and location, if they're a good deal, then we, we, we only give them the best deals in that market. Say it's in Florida. I'm in Louisiana right now. The main office is in Lafayette, Louisiana. We feed those leads to our partner in Florida, and he, he works those leads. And um, after that, he, it's his responsibility to put in our contract and either wholesale it or flip it, which we're not doing a ton of wholesaling right now. We're doing a lot of flipping because the inventory is so low and the market's so hot. And... Um, we, we do that with all our partners, the other four partners we have in different markets. And then I have one, uh, another partner who handles the nationwide and we have a, 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 him and another guy that, that do disposition that handle all the flips and wholesaling nationwide. So it's four people in, that are in regional territories that handle wholesaling flipping in those particular territories. And then we have two people, including me, I help out a lot on the, on the nationwide side. So three of us on the nationwide side that handle you know, the incoming calls, um, negotiations and getting the deal sold or get, getting realtors out there to look at the property for us to send us pictures to see what we're going to do with it. If we're going to wholesale it or flip it. Um, and then, so if you add all those people, you know, then we have, we have three to four maintenance guys at any given time that run around and go look and fix problems with the, the trailers. And then we have probably about a handful of contractors we, that we deal with. I mean, if you look, if you add in all the people we have to deal with, we, we probably got about 30 people on it. Nice, and man. That's impressive. Some that are, you know, 1099, some that are, you know, on payroll directly that are W-2. And, and then we have the, some that are, that are partners, that are JV partners that are in different regional territories. If you have been kicking yourself that you didn't start investing in real estate sooner, whether you're beginner, intermediate or advanced, 
any way you're looking to get it on a residential, commercial, land development, wholesaling, fix and flips, whatever it is, let's find a way to get you involved in some projects, get you some properties, whether you want to sell some properties to me, whether you want to buy some properties from me, whether residential, fix and flip, cash flow, multifamily, whatever it is you're looking for, let's figure out a way to get you involved or find a way for us to partner up on some deals. Go to www.nicknicknick.com, go on the consultation tab and figure out how to schedule an appointment to talk about where you fit in if you are not sure, or you can just reach out to me on any of my social media channels. If you go on www.nicknicknick.com slash links, you will see all the different ways to connect with me and figure out how we can start to work together, make it happen. Everybody that invests in real estate always just says they wish they did it sooner. Best time to start is today. Great, man. That, that's an impressive setup right there. I, I, I love it. And it's, again, those things I think are important pieces that people don't realize that hiring people, you can look at them as an expense or you can look at them as an investment. And obviously it's helping you get more quality of life and make more money. So I, you know, I know people tend to think that, well, that's a lot going out, but look at what that brings in. So obviously I think it's a, a huge business model that's helped you. And looking at the size of your portfolio, man, I definitely want to get to the kind of the crown jewel of all of it, which is mobile home park. So I've had some conversations with you about it. I'm super excited about learning more about it. This has been something that my focus has really turned to over the last probably six to 12 months. So talk a little bit about why mobile home parks, what excites you about them and what you guys are doing with them. Yeah, no, and I love talking about mobile home parks because I have this track record now from when I started investing in single family homes when I was 25 when I bought those $3 million of single family homes. And from all the way down the track record of me being a real estate investor, I've learned the hard way of what not to do, right? And um, single family home, homes are hard to scale, right? For one, and you know, it, it costs so much to buy a single family home. You pay a, buy a single family home for 125,000 and get 1500 bucks in rent, or you can buy a mobile home that I can pick up for 10, 15 grand and get 900 bucks a month in rent. So you do the math on and, and return on, yeah, I'll get fifteen hundred bucks a month for a hundred and twenty-five thousand dollar house, or you can spend ten, fifteen grand and get nine hundred bucks a month. Who's gonna get? Where, where's the better return, right? And I, for me, all the experience of doing maintenance on single-family homes versus mobile homes. <clears throat> well, let me back up. Let me tell you how I got into mobile home park investing. First, I read an article by Warren Buffett five years ago about the state of the economy and where housing will be in the next. 10, 20 years. And I read that article and he said, affordable housing will be the wave of the future. And he says specifically mobile homes are the last vestiges of affordable housing because inflation is going to kill the single family homes and wages are not keeping up with inflation. And there's another thing, baby boomers are retiring and getting out of their big single family homes and downsizing into smaller community homes like the 55 and over mobile homes because they don't want to, they don't need a big old house anymore. They want to get out of their house while they sell a lot of equity and tertiary to that is the millennial generation is trapped with college debt. There's like two point, I forget how many trillions of dollars. I think last time I checked, it's like 2.3, 2.4 trillion dollars worth of student debt that can't be paid back because the, the, all these people went to college and they, don't, they got jobs after that. And they, they didn't get a, a job that paid good enough to better get a single family home, car insurance, health insurance, get married, have kids, and then have, you know, buy a $150,000 to $350,000 single family home and have a mortgage. They're too strapped down with, with college debt. And that made a lot of sense to me when you think of all the things I just said, all those three, three four things. I read that. I was like, that makes a lot of sense. And I think I'm going to go start looking for a mobile home park. And right after that kind of just, you know, you kind of get what you put attention on. You call it the law of attraction or you, uh, whatever you think about it, you attract your life. After I read that article, I think literally like a week or two after that, because I started thinking about mobile home parks and mobile homes a lot. A realtor brought me a mobile home that I, a mobile home park that was off market that fell in his lap. And he didn't know anybody that, that bought, bought mobile home parks. He just knew that I was a real estate investor and I bought single family homes. Like, Hey, you want to take a look at that? I said, yeah, it's crazy to say that. I, I'll, I'll take a look at buying it and uh, end up getting it for a screaming deal. It was off market. Uh, the dad of the park had died and all the kids inherited and they didn't have anything to do with it. I bought it for 405,000. It appraised for like 730,000 as is. It was getting $7,200 a month in rent. 
Well, for me, it had like seven spots that were empty. It was a 24 unit here in Lafayette, Louisiana. It was in a great location right on the side of a McDonald's. It was kind of not in the best uh, areas, upper Lafayette, but it, but it was still in a great piece of real estate right off the interstate. For me, I knew I could take the rents from where they were to almost double because he was only charged like these older baby boomer generation type landlords. They never go up and rent and keep up with inflation. It's the craziest thing. Like he was charging like 435 bucks. 475 market rent was like 650 700 so i knew there there was a spread where you know he never there was uncaptured appreciated rents you know what i'm saying so and there were seven empty spots where i could put in new trailers and for me with my wholesaling business with all the leads that come through people that want to sell their houses I always get people that want to sell their trailers to be moved but i had no use for those leads because i was like what am i gonna do with a trailer to be moved well, for me in my head, I'm like, I could start taking all these people that want that call me through the wholesaling business and take their trailers and put them in the park because they had to, they would literally want to send me their trailers for peanuts because they had nowhere to, to, to move it for one. And they just wanted to off their lot because they're going to build a house and they weren't bankable, meaning the, the, they couldn't sell it to a retail buyer in a lot of cases because they were maybe 10 years old or older. And the banks didn't want to lend on them. So that was the opportunity for me to, to, to buy them for super cheap. So I would just offer them super low. I mean, I, I'd pick up some of these trailers for like 2,500 bucks that were worth like, you know, fifteen twenty thousand dollars $20,000 because they had nowhere else to, to, to sell them to. And I was like, look, I'll give you 2,500 bucks. It's going to cost me $2,000 to move it and another $3,000 to set up. So I'm all in at 7,500 moving them in there and I'm getting, you know, seven fifty eight hundred bucks a month in rent. So I, I so I knew that in the back of my head and I did, that's exactly what I did. I bought the park. I mean, that was the first park I ever had. I bought it four and a half years ago or three and a half, four, yeah, four years ago. Um, that park now does 15, seven right now. And I bought it. I doubled the rents and that park's probably worth a million bucks plus now. I mean, I owe like, I probably owe about 330 some thousand on it. I mean, it, it's just a cash cow. It spits out money every month. And um, for us as a team now, you know, if something breaks, it's cheap. If I have a busted water pipe, guess what? You just slide that skirting over. It's a little $5 part and it's done and it takes 30 minutes, right? You have a busted pipe in a single family home, you might have to bust up the concrete, right? Um, if they got a roof leak, guess what? You just get some cool seal from Home Depot. Cost you about 350 bucks. Another 150 $200 in labor for the data for my guys to go and do it. I got a brand new roof for seven years, five to seven years for 500 bucks. My roof goes out of my single family home. It could be seven to $10,000 that wipes out your income for the next a year or two. You have, uh, you know, you have stuff that breaks in it. It's just simple to fix. Everything about it was cheaper, but the rents weren't that much lower. So it's like, once I saw the cash, I was like, man, this is just makes way more sense than doing anything else. I put everything aside. And I was like, I'm not buying single family homes anymore. Well, I say that. I still buy single family homes for short term vacation rentals on the beach because it's, you know, we can do Airbnb and it, it rents a lot higher and it's a good quality tenant because they're only there for the week and they don't mess up your house and you get premium rent. And, you know, historically speaking, properties on the beach keep appreciating because they only made so much beach property. So I, I don't want to say I don't buy single family homes. We do own four of short term vacation rentals, two on the beach and two on lakes that we do rent out. That's the only kind of single family home that we like that we still buy is Airbnb on the water or highly desirable beachfront property. So we're scaling the mobile home park business. We got, we have, matter of fact, we have three parks in the contract right now, two in Pensacola, um, one in, in, uh, Indiana. And, um, you know, I, I partner up with my students all over the country. They come either come to one of my masterminds or they, they I get coached by them. And then we usually partner up on the deal and I'm just scaling my mobile home park business with the, with the communist takeover you see right now, I don't know what affiliation you know, are politically, but I'm not, I mean, the, the communists are trying to destroy this country and, you know, put so many regulations on things, you know, it, it's killing free market capitalism and it's hurting a lot of people. It's hurting the middle class and it's going to create a lot of poor people. Um, I think, I think as a whole, I've hedged my bets by <clears throat> getting into mobile home parks because the worse the economy gets people downsize, guess where they're going to go. They just they're going to rent some affordable housing. They can they can rent a fifteen hundred to two thousand dollar a month single family home, or they can get a trailer for eight hundred to a thousand bucks a month, and it's still nice. I mean, these trailers are nice on the inside. We fix them up, make them look, and you wouldn't even know you're inside of a mobile home. Um, they're going to get they're going to downsize into mobile homes and even apartments. Apartments have become unaffordable. So that's kind of my play. That's kind of what I'm doing right now, and uh, 
I'm stacking the cash for the crash. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm buying up mobile home parks. It, it's a, it's an asset class that's kind of untouched. You can still buy great deals out there. And that's where I'm putting my focus and attention along with my wholesaling and flipping business that creates cash for us. But yeah, man, that's kind of where I'm at. That's outstanding, man. And I agree with you. I, I've some of the parks that I've sold recently, when you look at the inside, if if I didn't tell the person that's looking at those videos that they were inside a mobile home, they would have no idea. And some of the apartment buildings that I've sold, you would actually a hundred percent say the mobile home park is nicer than the apartment building. So I think when that the more that stigma starts to move away, I think people are going to realize that some of these communities and some of these parks are are really well kept. There's a great sense of community there. And like you said, like they look nice. There really is nothing wrong with them. And affordable housing is a major, major thing that I think is coming up more and more prevalent every day. Like you said, wages are not keeping up so people can't afford the, the to keep up with inflation and just the, the house's price is going up. So I think this is a great move and a great resource and a great asset class that not enough people are talking about. So that was a big reason why I was like, man, I got to I got to hear about what you're doing. The, the one thing I know that you know that you're doing a little bit different. Uh, a lot of the mobile home park operators, they don't like to own the home. They like to sell them back to the tenant, whereas you actually like to own the, the thing. What's your thought process behind that strategy? I think there's a, it depends on where you're at. I'm a full-time real estate investor, so it makes sense for me to be fully involved in the game. I think a lot of people that maybe are a chiropractor, doctor, high net worth earner, maybe an engineer or some part that, that they don't, they only make money if they're working, but they get paid well. Maybe they make a half a million dollars to a million dollar W2 job but their time and energy is tied up in their job. It maybe may not make sense for them on a mobile home park where they have to do maintenance, right? Because then they have to, you have to have a team and I have a team. There's no, you know, there's no, it, it is a little bit more cumbersome when you have park owned homes because you have to handle maintenance, but it ain't no more cumbersome, more or less cumbersome than own an apartment or a single family home. You still got maintenance on those. But I think for somebody that um, doesn't want any headache, yeah, the, the lot rent model makes sense for them, but your return on investment is going to be a lot slower. I mean, those lot red parks are selling for like a, a six to eight cap. Um, it's a slower return on investment, but it's a less headache. So I like to own the, the mobile home because it meshes well with my model because I'm a professional wholesaler and flipper. We get these trailers for five, 10, $15,000. I mean, how can I lose when I'm buying a trailer for 10, 15 grand that I can get eight, 900 bucks a month for? That's a one, one and a half year payback. It's so it doesn't make any sense for me not to not own the trailer. I want to own the trailer and I have a team and I'm fully immersed in the game. I'm there every day. We have a, we have a system, we have system processes. We have a team. Yeah. I mean, that, I think that's the difference. What you have to ask it, how, listen, at the end of the day, you're paid in correlation to the problem you sell and uh, problem you solve and the problems you can confront in life and the more problems and more bullshit you can handle the more money you make. That's just how it is. And yes, it is more problems. It is more bullshit owning the trailer, but I get paid better. I mean, I get 900 to a thousand bucks a month for some of these trailers that I own lot rent. You only get like 250, 300, maybe 350 in some areas, maybe more in some areas, depending on where you're at in the country, uh, maybe 500 in some really high end areas in Florida, say California, but it's all relative. Those people are getting higher rents too for the trailer. If they own the trailer, they're getting 1500 bucks instead of a thousand. So I like owning the trailer for that reason. And another reason, and this is the most pertinent and important reason why I like to own the trailer is because nobody wants to do it and it creates a vacuum. And that's where the deals are at. It's hard to find a good lot rent park right now that you don't pay a premium for because everybody's chasing that, right? If everybody's chasing that, it drives down the cap rate and drives up the price. Nobody wants the headache of the maintenance. So what does that happen? The, the parks that are park owned, are selling super cheap and that's where the vacuum's at. And that's where I play because nobody wants to do it. And that's why I'm crushing it. Ever wanted to play the drums or do you want to get your kids some drum lessons to burn some of that energy while they are all locked up? Take advantage of a free drum lesson with one of the tri-state area's most respected drummers, Dan LaMagna. Dan LaMagna has played in such bands as Crown of Thorns, Suicide City, Biohazard, The Real McKenzie's, Sworn Enemy, The Walls of Jericho. He has played all over the world, and he is also endorsed by such companies as DW, Vader, and Sabian. Dan has taught tons of people from all different age groups and all different music styles. He can teach adults, kids, advanced, beginner, any types of styles from metal, all different types of percussion, whatever style you want. Get a free drum lesson today 
from Dan. All you need to do is text the word DRUMMER, D-R-U-M-M-E-R, to 833-632-0585. Again, text the word DRUMMER, D-R-U-M-M-E-R, to the number 833-632-0585 for your free online drum lesson. That's awesome, man. And uh, speaking of crushing mobile homes, I know you have a mastermind coming up very soon. I think it's September, right? Talk a little bit about what you're doing on the coaching yep. for mobile yep. home parks and for so wholesale. Yeah. So, I mean, I teach people virtually, we have courses and coaching virtually over the phone, but you know, I do do four masterminds a year. I do two of my beach house in Destin, Florida that are more generalized on wholesaling, flipping land development, storage units, apartments, uh, mobile home parks. We kind of bring different experts and we do like a mastermind in Destin, but I do two a year at my house here in Louisiana to actually just focus on mobile home parks. The next one is September 24th and 25th here in Lafayette, Louisiana, where we're focusing on just my mobile home park business. We have my CFO there, my property manager, my lead maintenance guy. And it's a two-day boot camp where we just deep dive the whole business. Why mobile homes? How to find them? How to negotiate them? How to underwrite them? How to get the debt? How to raise the private money? How to put in the property manager? How to rehab them? How to refinance? How to reposition them? That's the first day. Then the second day, we, we rent a, a party bus and we jump in and we go look at all the, the parks. And we just we go and just look at each park and kind of tell the, the good, the bad, and the ugly of every park. Awesome, man. And how do people find out more about how to link up with you if they want some help, some coaching, some more information? Yeah. If, if they want, if you're just getting started and you're hearing me talk, you probably shouldn't just jump into mobile home parks. It's more <laughs> of an advanced strategy. You probably should start with wholesaling. Wholesaling is definitely the foundation of becoming a professional real estate investor. If you know how to find deals, then it kind of builds off of that, right? It'd be like you trying to go and learn algebra before you learn you know, the ABCs, the one, two, threes. It's, I always tell people yeah, real estate investing and learning is just, it has a gradient scale of learning. You start with wholesaling. That's the foundation builds the, the platform of how to find deals. Because I didn't start with wholesaling. That's why I bought all those single family homes back in 2012. I didn't know how to buy them super cheap, stupid cheap enough or, or low enough to where I don't hurt myself. And, and I end up losing a lot of money in those houses because I didn't know how to go direct to seller and buy at wholesale prices. You make money when you buy, not when you sell. And if you don't know how to buy super cheap, then you're going to hurt yourself because the ebbs and flows of the marketplace, you know, you buy high and then the market crashes and, and you end up hurting yourself because you end up having a property with no equity or negative equity because you didn't know how to buy right. Wholesaling teaches you how to buy right. And that's what my whole book called The Source of the Deal is all about. If you want to pick that book up, go to thesourceofthedeal.com. It's a free copy. I give it away for free. My gift to you. You can follow me at uh, Chris Root Entrepreneur on Facebook and Chris Root, just press the like button. My business page is Chris Root Entrepreneur. I do a Facebook Live once a week just talking about general real estate entrepreneurship, uh, you know, gen things in, in, in general. And then you can follow me at Real Estate Root on, on Instagram where we, me and my wife share a whole journey. Every day we're doing real estate deals. We, sh we show people that. And if you want coaching, go to chrisroot.com, book a call with me and my team. We'll see if you are ready to start this crazy journey called entrepreneurship. Um, and if you want to come to a mastermind, just inbox me in one of my platforms on Facebook or Instagram. We can hop on a phone and see if it's a good fit for you. But I don't sell a bill of goods. I don't tell you this is easy. This is going to be the hardest thing you've ever done in your life. But it would be the, also the most rewarding if you can make it go right and become successful at it. They give you more time and freedom and more satisfaction than you probably ever will get out of a W-2 job. I'm not saying there's nothing wrong with a W-2 job. It depends on what your fear factor is and how much bullshit can you handle. Mm -hmm. And all, all entrepreneurship is, guys, it ain't about how much brains you got. You do need some brains, but you need more bronze than brains. What you need is big old balls. <laughs> That'll get you further than any college degree. And I got a college degree. So all you Harvard graduates out there that watch this and tell me that, hey, um, I'm super smart. I'm Val Victorian in my class. Well, I can show you a lot of Val Victorians that I knew growing up that are miserable because they thought their college degree was going to take them places. And that was one of the biggest scams of the 21st century is a college degree. I love that, man. That's very impressive. And obviously, anybody listening, you can go to the show notes and I'll have links for everything he just said for ways to follow him and link up with him and all those things. And I'm looking forward to hearing more and more, man. This has been awesome. I really appreciate you doing it. A uh, couple final questions before I let you go. I like to call this the victory lap as we just kind of button everything up. Uh, one of them is, I know you said you read a lot. What's a, what's a book you recommend? Man, my, one of my favorite books is um, The Science of Getting Rich by uh it's a walt d wallace a wallace d waltz um everybody thinks that napoleon's hills thinking go rich is the original mindset book it's not 
he actually got all most of his information and copied and mimicked a lot of um, the science of getting rich. That's a really small book. It is phenomenal. I mean, what you got to understand, guys, is entrepreneurship is a, is a spiritual journey. It's more about what, how you think about what you're doing versus how you think about how you're going to do what you're going to do. Do you have the confidence in yourself? I, I'm not that bright. I'm just too stupid to quit. And I have a dream. And, and I think a lot of people don't day, daydream enough, right? That's why I just said you don't daydream enough. I visualize my life. I am where I am today because I visualized it 20 years ago. And I was just too stupid to quit. And I just kept moving and moving and pushing, even though it got hard. And you'll see that the world will open up to what you want it to be as long as you don't quit. And I think there's a lot to be said about visualization, the law of attraction, whatever you want to call it. Um, I think you just need to do more visualization and more pondering about what you want and think about what you want and stop thinking about what you don't want, more importantly, because most people think about what they don't want every day and they just get more of that because you get what you think about, whether you like that or not. Um, that's not my rules. That's just physics right your thoughts are vibrations their frequencies they go out in the universe and you're going to attract persons places events happenstances whether you know believe that or not that's not my rules that's just what science and physics have discovered and it kind of goes hand in glove about the science of getting rich and the, the secondary book i would follow up with that is um the book called um the um what psycho cybernetics psycho cybernetics you got to, he taught, it's, it's basically the way you think about yourself, right? You, you need to think highly of yourselves. Most people think so low of themselves that that's what they get more of. And it, it kind of shows you how to build self-confidence and really mold yourself into the person you want to be. I read those books. I've read Psycho Cybernetics, I think three or four times. I've read The Science of Getting Rich about eight times. So I try to read those about every other year, once a year, just to refresh. And you should read the classic books like that multiple times because you'll pick up things as your awareness gets higher as you get older your awareness gets better and you'll pick up more and more things in a book that you didn't pick up the first time so those two books right there i think would be great on um just your overall mindset i mean how to do real estate is not that hard right it doesn't take a rock we're not splitting atoms we're not flying to the mood we're finding motivated sellers we're negotiating with them we're putting them in a contract it ain't that hard right it's the way you think about you doing that and the way you think about what you're going to be doing that's going to determine if you're going to be successful. I just know that I'm the baddest motherfucker in the room. I don't care if you don't know that. I don't care if nobody even thinks that. Hell, I don't care if my kids and wife don't think that as long as you know that you're the baddest motherfucker. And I think that's what is going to determine is you just got to know you're the baddest motherfucker in the room. Excuse my language. I love it, man. I think that that's a great thing to end on. And I think that you summed that whole thing up perfectly. And I couldn't agree with you more, man. This has been absolutely awesome. I really appreciate you being so generous with your time. Is there any final thoughts before I let you go today? No, just keep skilling up. Keep learning. If you need help with your real estate game, your entrepreneur games, inbox me or go to chrisrude.com. Awesome, man. And again, those will be in the show notes. You, sir, definitely bring your A-game to everything you do. I appreciate you coming on today. Thank you very much for your time. Chris Rude, ladies and gentlemen.